my last slide is a slide of Liz. I, I initially had it at the beginning, and I, every time I pass. You ready? Good afternoon. I'm Bob Glushko, and once again, it's my distinct pleasure and privilege to uh, award the David E. Rummelhart Prize to a distinguished member of this community. Uh, this is the seventh of these prizes that uh, we've, we've uh, awarded since we uh, began this prize in 2000. Uh, it's really uh, great to see how many people are here, to see four past recipients of the Rummelhart Prize, John Anderson, All right, Rich Schifrin. Rich Schifrin, I know he's here. Uh, Arvind Joshi. And Paul Smolensky. We like to say that this prize is an honor not only to the recipient, but also to all of you uh, for being making cognitive science something really important. And part of what the, uh, this prize is about is to help raise the visibility of this field. And uh, we're now hearing people say that the Rummelhart Prize is a Nobel Prize in cognitive science. Now, that gives Nobel more credit than he deserves. <laughs> but it is good to have people say that sort of thing, because I think it really is important that we've helped establish this field as something that, that is a real discipline uh, with the kind of stature that a, that a Nobel Prize would in detail. Uh, it's also great, I, I always say this is my, my nth of 50. Uh, I hope to give away the first 50 of these prizes. This is number seven, I got 43 to go, but I go to the gym a lot. <laughs> and um, that means that I will have the pleasure of giving away this prize to a lot of people in this room. In fact, some of them are probably graduate students here. And that's kind of a neat thought to feel that this, this prize isn't a prize to the old guard, it's a prize to, to the field as it evolves over time, and as you've seen, there's been a wide variety of recipients representing different disciplines and different demographic slices of the field and so on. Uh, so with that, I'd like to introduce uh, Linda Smith, who is the incoming chair of the Rummelhart Prize Selection Committee, who will introduce Jeff Allman, the seventh recipient of the Rummelhart Prize. Okay, first off, I want to thank um, Robert Glushko for this really extraordinary generosity um, to the field and to our community, and to remind you all that this was a prize that um, Bob felt um, necessary to give to really honor all the contributions of um, Dave Rummelhart, both as a mentor and as a scientist and as a human being. And we all hope to live up to it, and thus far, um, a number of uh, recipients have. So let me just tell you what's going to happen here. I have a few little, before we get to the introduction part to go. Um, first of all, how this is going to work, I'm going to introduce um, Jeff. Okay. Then Bob is going to give him the prize. <coughs> <laughs> then Jeff will speak until um, 645. And those of you with posters, don't you worry, we have delayed the poster session and it will go a little longer so you can stay through the questions. Though so he'll talk and then we'll have questions till about 6.45. There will also be a reception following, which is at the Delta Fountain. And once again, don't worry if you don't know how to get there because there's going to be people waiting outside to escort you to the Delta Fountain. And at that location, um, we will announce the eighth winner of the prize. You can make your bets now and then pay up there. All right? Okay, so that's how it's going to work. So now, it is, um, I'm delighted and honored to um, introduce Jeff Elman as um, this year's winner. And I'll say a few things about why I think this is such a deserved honor. So 
the phenomenon that we seek to understand in cognitive science are in fact extraordinary, extraordinarily complicated. And it often seems, um, at least for me and I think for many of us, that we sometimes miss the forest and the tangle of the trees, but we also sometimes fail to see the single tree very clearly for what it actually is. What I think is the case is Jeff is that for throughout his career, he has had the exquisite ability to pull figure from ground and to hold phenomena and ideas and solutions up in a really clear and obvious form for us all to see, bringing clarity and truly new solutions and ideas. And these ideas have in fact not just been exciting, but they've been useful throughout the field so that now they show up everywhere. So much so, in fact, that some of the younger people in this room may think that there are always these ideas out there. But they weren't. They were actually thought up by Jeff. <laughs> and people could list many interesting things here as to what he's um, offered. And I may be well, I'm going to go through a list of what I think some, a list of what I think some of his um, most wonderful ideas that have really made a difference are, and I may be leaving out some of your favorites, so just consider this my personal list, okay? So some of the ideas that Jeff has given us is the idea of parallel processing and speech recognition, the idea of nested dynamics and connectionist nets, what gave us so-called recurrent or Elman nets, the idea that perhaps good computationally powerful consequences could emerge from developmental immaturity. That such maturity could be there for a reason, that it might pay off to start small. He gave us the ideas of nested dynamics of learning and development of evolution, and there's really an extraordinary series of um, papers that are quite well worth reading that led eventually um, to the book that he did with Liz Bates and Kim Plunkett and Mark Johnson on rethinking innateness. And this is a book that I think continues to play an extraordinarily important role in developmental psychology and understanding of developmental process. He also gave us the idea, this is actually my favorite actually, of meanings as trajectories of activation in a mental state space. These ideas, he's also been recently applied um, to larger, to the is issues of history and language change. And I think if one were to summarize all of his work, that it really is about time, and more particularly about change over time, and about nested processes and nested time scales. Jeff is also not just an original thinker and a great scientist, he's also an individual with outstanding values, real values. One of them is loyalty. He received his BA from Harvard, then his PhD in linguistics from the University of Texas, Austin in 1977. He went straight to UCSD and has been there ever since. Great loyalty to an institution. And he served there from assistant professor to distinguished professor. He served as Director of Cognitive Science, as co-director of the Kavli Institute for Brain and Mind, and he's even been a dean. <laughs> he's been on the governing board of this society, he served as its president, and he is a fellow of this society. And through all these roles and by his serving on journals and various advisory boards, he's really worked steadfastly to the building of the bridges across individual disciplines that is what makes those bridges, that is what makes cognitive science what it is. And he's been a key player in the history and the emergence of the society and in the field of cognitive science. Finally, Jeff is kind. He is compassionate. He is there even in the worst of times for his friends, giving them strength that we can all aspire to. And so um, I give you this year's winner, the 2007, the seventh winner of the um, Rummel Hart Prize, a gentleman and an original thinker, Jeff Elman. <laughs>
Jeff actually gets two things. He gets this beautiful plaque that he will hang on his wall in his office or something like that. So, <laughs> photo opportunity. Get to this, which is a check for one hundred thousand dollars. Bob tells me the market plunged today, and I should go find an ATM real quickly. <laughs> but I trust him. Uh, can can you hear me? Okay. Um, I have to say, I haven't been so embarrassed or so so uh, so uh, nervous since I gave my dissertation defense 30 years ago. Um, I, I want to thank Linda for those very kind and generous comments. I, I'm not sure I believe them, but they're certainly um, very much appreciated, um, and they, they warm my heart. Um, getting this prize is a tremendous honor. Uh, it's also very humbling. Um, it's particularly significant because I think uh, Dave Rommelhart is uh, stands as one of the great figures in our in our field. He was a, a deep thinker, creative thinker, um, willing to go places that other people weren't, um, and and tremendously loyal and generous to his students, his colleagues, and his friends. Um, in in creating this prize, Bob Glushko and his wife Pamela S Samuelson have uh, clearly done something wonderful to honor Dave's memory. Done something wonderful for us, holding him up. Uh, as somebody to uh, to aspire to be like, um, and as Linda said, it's been uh, I think a tremendous had a tremendous impact on the society and on the field. It makes a statement that what we do in cognitive science is important and it's worth a, a prize of this sort. So um, please join me once more in thanking Bob and Pamela for doing this. The question I want to address um, tonight has to do with words and their meaning. Um, by almost any theory of language, words are foundational. They're amongst the first elements of language that are learned. Um, and uh, uh, many people believe that they also play a critical role in learning about grammar. So the issue of words and uh, how they come to have their meaning is, is important. It's an issue that has two facets. One is the question of form, the representation, are these data structures or are they processes? Uh, and it also raises the question of content. Um, what is meaning? What, is, what are words about? Um, now I think although there are many approaches to the lexicon, it's fair to say that there's a relatively uncontroversial consensus that's well expressed um, in the writings here of Ray Jackendoff, who in his 2002 book uh, wrote that for a first approximation, the lexicon is the store of words and long-term memory from which the grammar constructs phrases and sentences and a lexical entry, which tonight for our purposes will be words, lists a small chunk of phonology, a small chunk of syntax, and a small chunk of semantics. Uh, a corollary of this is that we should think about words as operands, and at the risk of being a bit obscure in using that word, um, but I use it because it will figure later in, in what I want to say. Um, it simply means that it's a data structure upon which mental processes operate. So it contains things such as meaning, pronunciation, and grammatical properties. That's all I mean by operand in this case. And I want to present a different view, a different possibility. Um, this talk really has two parts. Um, hopefully you like them both. If you only like one, I'll be happy. Um, I'm sunk if you like neither. Um, and, and each part addresses one of these facets that I referred to, the question of form and the question of content. They arise out of two different strands of research that um, I've been involved with um, collaboratively with a number of, of people. Um, the first of these was computational. Uh, I've been interested for a long time in trying to understand how dynamics can be harnessed to capture or represent structure. And, and the focus was really on structure and sentence level processing. Uh, in the course of all of this, I realized that the things I was using casually to represent words really did not have the kinds of properties um, that most people ascribe to words and certainly were very dissimilar from the, what 
what somebody like Ray Jackendoff would assume is um, the meaning of the form of, of, of words. Uh, I kept quiet about this for a long time because um, I wasn't sure what to make of it. Um, they really, they really were so different. I, I wasn't clear on what the implications were. Then there was a second strand of research um, that I'll be talking about that involved psycholinguistic experiments, uh, a, a, a series of, of studies that I've been doing over now almost 10 years with Mary Hare and Ken McRae on uh, sentence processing in adults. And we were concerned with meaning, primarily the meaning of verbs. Um, and there was an unexpected outcome here, which is that uh, we, we ended up with results that were that seemed to be incompatible with the standard notion of lexical entries and the lexicon and verb representation. But those results turned out um, to be solved, or at least uh, amenable to the different view of the lexicon that was suggested by the computational work. So these two strands come together, and that, that will form the structure of this, this talk. Um, the place I want to begin is just with background, as Linda has said, I've, I've long been interested um, in time and studied networks like this in which there are inputs that go through an intermediate level and yield an output with recurrence, and it's the form of this recurrence that gives the system some memory. Um, so these, these systems can be given um, a series of inputs, in this case, words. The outputs can actually be many things, thematic roles, grammatical judgments. I've often used prediction. Um, for various reasons I won't go into. Um, so that in this case, the output would be years and given the next input and so on. And this turns out to be a very powerful mechanism for driving uh, learning, although it's clearly not all that language is about. In the course of trying to understand how the system works, a natural place is to look at this, the innards of the system, which start off ill-formed, random, and over the course of learning, take on structure. Um, now, this, this internal system is really uh, simply a set of units that, when given an input, um, have some pattern of activation. And that pattern of activation can be understood as a point in a high-dimensional space. And then the next step is simply to look at the similarity structure of the internal representations of these words. And uh, the result after learning is, is interesting. Um, distributional facts, as we've known and know from systems like um, HAL and Beagle and LSA and, and many others, um, are very powerful cues as to grammatical categories, as to meaning categories. And so here's a hierarchical structure tree that shows um, the categories that emerge uh, implicitly after learning this simple prediction task. The networks have another property, though, um, which, which was very intriguing to me, which is that um, they can learn dependencies that are interrupted. So, for example, the fact that is depends on the singular nature of girl and are on the plural nature of parents um, is something that these networks can learn and can generalize beyond, in fact, the, the training data. Um, and so in trying to understand this, and this is where this notion of operand um, is going to become important, um, Paul Rodriguez, Janet Wiles, and I decided to uh, start small. Um, we began with a very simple artificial language, A to the N, B to the N, some number of A's followed by an equal number of B's. So A, 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 B, 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 A, B, and so on are all grammatical. Unequal numbers of A's and B's are not. It's an interesting language because it has some of the properties of natural language formally um, and is a subset of more interesting languages like palindrome languages, which we've also studied and turn out to have a similar solution, but this is the simplest case. Um, th these, these networks then process sequences of A's and B's, two hidden units, two inputs, two outputs. The input is whatever it is, and the network's task is to learn to predict what should come next. And there are a couple of critical points where you can tell that the network has either learned or failed to learn what the pattern is. That is, once it gets a series of A's and it gets its first B, it should only predict B's and just the right number of B's. The networks do that, and they generalize beyond the number uh, N that they've been exposed to. And so we wanted to know what the solution was. Um, in, in traditional discrete automata theory, um, you would assume some sort of stack mechanism. And we wanted to know how the network solved the problem. Um, once again, the activation patterns really map on to uh, have a geometric interpretation so that the activations correspond uh, to some point in a two-dimensional space. Um, and after training, here's, here's 
a, a quick summary of what the solution involves. So at the outset of a sequence, at the beginning of a sequence, there is a state space, a sp the, the vector shown at the bottom in these two dimensional spaces where the network is. But there's a third dimension, which you can think of as a kind of attractor force, magnetism or, or gravity, which captures the fact that the state of the network depends not only on the input that's driving it, but the recurrence that pushes the states in different directions. So in this case, we've got uh, a force that's pulling the uh, state of the network down toward an attracting point. And so I'm going to, instead of showing the in state on the two-dimensional plane, show it up here where the force is greatest. And with successive inputs of A, uh, the network oscillates closer and closer to this uh, fixed point. And a B comes in and does two things. One, it moves it to another region of space, and it also changes the dynamics so that we now have what looks like a mountain. And we walk down the mountain. However high we get is determined by how low we were in the valley of A's, and uh, the dynamics of these two regimes are matched such, such that the uh, repelling force of the repelling system is the inverse of the attracting force of the attractor system. And it works very uh, elegantly to provide a kind of counting mechanism. Now, as I said, this can be used for palindromes as well. The point of all of this, aside from the fact that it's work that I'm, I'm very pleased to be involved with, uh, it's not well known, but I, I think it's, it's uh, important, is that all is well and good when you think about A's and B's, but if this is really what's going on in the models of natural language, uh, then we have the system where the words, or the A's and B's here, really have no intrinsic meaning apart from their effect on the states and the dynamics of the system. Um, and so there, there are a couple of conclusions. One is that the, the weights of the system include dynamics, and it's the dynamics which we could think of as the grammar. There are paths through this system that are licit and, and felicitous and others that are, are not. And words that are not objects upon which our mental processes operate, rather they're operators, they're stimuli. And to understand them, you really don't ascribe meaning to them without understanding the dynamics of the system. So that was the curious conclusion. And, and, and those of you who are psycholinguists or familiar with issues of lexical representation and retrieval and access and so on, uh, it's an alien way of thinking about words. This is why I kept quiet for a long time. Um, and now I want to talk to talk, and I'll talk a little bit more about the second line of research, and you'll see how they, these two aspects hopefully dovetail together. In all of this, meaning does not figure very prominently, but for many years, um, people have asked me, well, do I really think language is about prediction? And my answer is no, I don't. I think it's about something, but I'm not sure what it is. In these systems, you see very clearly that meaning is tied to the function being computed. And it's never been clear to me what that function is in language. It's, it's easy to say it's about transmitting information. Uh, I think we can do that. Um, I think we do other things with language. And so I've shied away from, from that issue. Um, not because I don't think it's important, but because I have not had any clue as to what an answer might, might be. <coughs> but in fact, I've pursued a second line of research with, with Mary and Ken where this issue really has come to the fore and focusing on, on verb meaning. So let me tell you about some of these experiments and where they have taken us. Um, verbs are really interesting. Um, I think they're more interesting than nouns, although nouns are certainly interesting. They're the glue that holds things together. Uh, they're the things that I would wager other communication systems, non-human communication systems, really lack in any, any richness. Um, there are two aspects of meaning that it's traditional to distinguish what are often called subcategorization frames and uh, selectional restrictions or more modern, more modern terms, thematic rules. Uh, let me just quickly, for those of you who are unfamiliar with these terms, tell you what I mean. So by subcategorization frames, it's simply the observation uh, that different verbs uh, allow different complements can continue in different ways. So he admitted could either continue with a sentence such as, the students had little chance of succeeding, but it could also continue with just the direct object. He admitted the students into the room. These are two different subcategorization frames. Verbs differ in terms of what they permit, and their preferences or biases also differ. This is all information that most people would argue constitutes an important part of what it means to know 
a verb, the meaning of a verb and how to use it. Selectional restrictions in thematic roles refer to the fact that the arguments, say, that a verb might take um, often depend critically on that verb. So you eat things that are edible, you drink things that are potable. As Jim McCauley pointed out um, more than three decades ago, some of these verbs are very specific. Uh, you only devein shrimp, uh, to unless, unless you're Buffy the Vampire Slayer or a <laughs> mortician, I suppose, but it's, it's normally shrimp. Um, and you only diagonalize matrices. So this also is part of the knowledge of, um, of, of, of verb and verb meaning. Uh, people, the interest now has, has focused more on semantic restrictions. Uh, thematic role simply refers to the fact that in a sentence like this, uh, the teacher plays the role of agent, John is the recipient, and the book is the thing being given, uh, theme or under some definitions a patient, more conventionally known syntactically as a direct object. Um, now, there's a problem that arises, and this is one of the problems that Mary and Ken and I were interested in, which is under normal conditions where language comes in incrementally a word at a time, and given the optionality or the variability that most verbs have, that is, verbs don't have a single uh, set of, of complements or arguments, but sometimes many, there arises the possibility of temporary ambiguity. So one of these forms, there are two I'll mention, has to do with the ambiguity between the first example I gave, direct objects versus the sentential complement. So when you hear incrementally a word at a time, you, or you read it, he admitted the students, at that point you don't know what the role of students is. It could either continue if the sentence were into the room, in which case the students are the direct object, or alternatively, it could continue, he admitted the students would not succeed. And in that case, the role of students is different. It's now the subject of an embedded uh, sentence or sentential complement subject. Uh, you'll, you'll probably notice that if you say he admitted that, the ambiguity goes away. But under conditions where people omit the that, uh, we don't know at the students what the role of students will be. So that's an ambiguity, and we were interested in how do people cope with that? What kind of information is available to them? How does it interact? What's the time course of that? Um, a second ambiguity um, has to do, oh, let's see. Okay. So let me, let me now turn to some, some data, some results. Um, so one of the proposals is given that kind of ambiguity, how do people cope with it? An early proposal was they use heuristics, simple, dumb, but very fast procedures for guessing. Uh, I'm referring to things uh, such as minimal, uh, uh, minimal attachment or late closure, and that these work very quickly, and then a, a little bit later, the rest of the brain comes along and says, hey, dummy, you made a mistake. This isn't the right parse. It's got to be something else. So this was uh, a two-pass or uh, a two-stage uh, approach. Um, another approach which has, um, I think, become quite popular and, and many people subscribe to is that um, comprehenders are sensitive to the statistical patterns of usage of these verbs and things like the plausibility of a noun as either direct object or, or, or so on. Um, now, the, the, the problem is that the, the experimental results are pretty mixed. Um, they're, they're not um, unambiguous themselves. And in trying to understand this, uh, Marion Ken and I followed an observation um, initially made by Doug Rowland and Dan Jurafsky, which is a verb like admit, the one I used in the example before, if you look at its overall usage in a corpus, that is the percent of time that it's follow the noun that follows it is either a direct object or the subject of a sentential complement or something else, um, it's roughly mixed. There's no clear bias of this verb, yet some Experiments seem to show a bias in a sensitivity, and others didn't. Um, well, it, if, if you think a bit about the meaning of admit, you realize that admit actually has two senses. There's the allow in sense, and there's also the acknowledge sense. And if you do the same corpus analysis now controlling for sense, you find that when an allow means let in, it's always used with a direct object, whereas much more of the time when it's used in the acknowledged sense, it's followed by a sentential complement. So if you know what the meaning of the verb is, then this probabilistic structure becomes less probabilistic. Uh, 
Um, and an and obvious test then is simply to construct contexts that would give people cues as to the likely meaning. So imagine a context that, uh, that biases listeners or comprehenders to, to expect the acknowledged meaning. Uh, for over a week, the trail guide had been denying any problems with the two high school students walking the entire Appalachian Trail. And then the critical test sentence, uh, finally, he admitted the students. And at this point, we're interested to see what people's expectations are. The sentence will continue with a sentential compliment. He admitted the students had little chance of succeeding. And that's consistent with the meaning. That is, that is the syntactic structure that you would expect with that. On the other hand, if you have a context that biases toward allowing in, the two freshmen on the waiting list refused to leave the professor's office until he let them into the class. Then again, the same critical sentence. Finally, he admitted the students. Uh, in this case, we expect he admitted the students into the class, right? The direct object structure would be appropriate. And when it continues in the other way, that is, he admitted the students had little chance of getting in, people show signs by their reading time of distress, cognitive distress. Uh, it's harder for them to process this. It wasn't what they um, expected. And, and so the, the conclusion we came to reasonably, and it's a conclusion a lot of people have been, have been sympathetic to, is that structure and meaning are really closely tied together. And there's a specific lesson here that the meaning of the verb should encode not only its syntactic structure, but the relationship between the meaning and the, and the, the structure that's preferred. A second ambiguity that arises is this main verb versus reduced relative ambiguity. The man arrested is also temporarily ambiguous because it could either continue the man arrested the criminal, in which case we have an active verb and the man is the agent, the doer of the arresting. But it could also continue the man arrested by the detective. It's perfectly good. In which case the man is now the patient. So here's an ambiguity. Uh, what McRae, Spivey, Knowlton, and Tannenhaus noted is that there's a sensitivity to what this first noun is, the identity of the first noun. So if comprehenders encounter something like the cop arrested, they're slower to read by the detective than if it's the crook arrested by the detective. Because cops are better arrestors and encountering a cop now where it is in the patient role is a bit incongruous, whereas crooks are very good patients of being arrested, and so the uh, reduced relative is more felicitous. This leads to the conclusion then that verbs need to uh, not only know about the um, connection between sense, meaning, and structure, but also have a good sense of who their preferred the fillers of, of thematic roles are. So there's a verb specificity here. Um, again, meaning determines structure. Now there are flies in the ointment, and this is where it gets interesting. The first time I gave this talk, I had files in the ointment, and people looked at me, and I, um, I thought they couldn't, they didn't know the idiom, and then I realized it wasn't a question of idiom; it was a question of idiots, <laughs> me. Um, Um, so, if there is this knowledge about good fillers of thematic roles, then you might expect this will show up not only in a sentence processing experiment, but also in priming. That is, hearing a uh, good agent uh, of a verb ought to facilitate, ought to lead to expectations about that verb. So you should get priming. Um, and, and so this led then to a test of that um, by presenting words like professor followed by their related or expected verbs, professor followed by lecturing, and, and looking at the um, speed of uh, processing lecturing relative to when lecturing is preceded by an unrelated noun. Um, and we did this for a variety of thematic roles, agents, um, patients, instruments, and locations, doing a, a norming study ahead of time to find out what people's intuitions were about um, what activities um, were associated with agents, patients, instruments, and locations. And as you'd expect, I hope, um, the, the speed of processing these targets when they were preceded, these verb targets when they were preceded by um, a related agent, patient, instrument, or location um, was greater. So there was a positive priming effect. Now that's not the fly in the ointment. Um, the fly in the ointment is this. Um, 
all of this leads to a very commonsensical proposal that the representation of the verb admit uh, should consist of something like this. Uh, separate entries for sense that are sense biased that in the let in sense uh, it has the following subcategorization frames and probabilities with constraints on the selection or restrictions or the thematic role fillers um, of the arguments and that for a different sense you have a different sense a set of, of, of probabilities and so on. That would be a reasonable and not very radical uh, departure from anything and I think that follows from everything so far. The fly is this. Take the the um, study I just showed, the priming study, and, and, and um, consider the following variant. And this is, this is work that uh, Ferretti, Kudis, and McRae just reported. And it involves not only behavior, but also looking at um, event-related potentials, ERPs. When you have a verb now priming a location, was skating before arena, and you compare that to the unrelated case where arena is preceded by a verb that's not associated with that event, you might expect to find a facilitation for the related case. But here's another version of the related case where we have had skated as a prime for arena, and one might expect the same effect. Um, in fact, you don't get that. For the was case, was skating, you do prime arena, but in the had case, you don't. And, and that's the fly, that is, the two related cases, only one of them yields priming. Now, there's, a, there's another study, and uh, Hannah Rhoda will talk about this tomorrow afternoon, which, which um, implicates aspect, and that's what this difference is between had and was, in a completely different domain. But I think it makes a, 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 very, a very similar kind of point. So in the work that Hannah did, she contrasted um, people's preferences for interpreting ambiguous pronouns. John handed a book to Bob, he. There is uh, a tendency to assume that he refers to Bob. Uh, you, you can test this by asking people to continue the sentence. What Hannah did was to contrast that with was handing. And now that strengthens the bias for preferring John. So there's, there's, there's still actually uh, under some conditions a preference for Bob, but it strengthens the John interpretation simply by the change of aspect. What do these have in common and what, is this, what does this mean? Well, I think uh, a, a reasonable hypothesis is that the role of aspect here um, is to constrain the way we construe an event. And so when we say that somebody had skated, this is a preamble to talking about what they're doing now. And the location is no longer as relevant as when we foreground the ongoingness of the situation and we say they were skating, in which case the salience of the location is elevated. And similarly, a similar uh, argument I think can be made for the pronoun, effect on pronoun in interpretation. Now, this is a fly in the ointment of this template approach because it says that uh, the uh, the association between a verb and its arguments is bo modulated now by something that has nothing to do with the strict prosaic grammatical syntactic properties, but rather has to do with construal and brings into the ball game the notion of an event and that the interpretation of all of this is critically hinges on, on thinking about these as, as events. So, so this relationship now is contingent on aspect. What else would matter? Well, we reasoned that if the connection between these participants in the sentence and the verb really was a matter of events and event knowledge and event representation and construal of events, then certainly who's doing the event ought to matter quite a bit. So consider the case of save, and this is some work that uh, Clinton Bicknell um, and Mary and Ken and I have been, been doing. Uh, and think about and contrast the sentences, the shopper saved and your expectation for what will be saved, um, money, coupons, whatever, versus the lifeguard saved. Now, if you remember these earlier slides about deveining and eating and the selection of restrictions, uh, the assumption has always been that verbs have a set of selection of restrictions which are more or less immutable. But here we have a case where the selection restrictions really depend on another argument, the, namely the, the, the agent. Um, and, and so um, we asked um, 
human human participants to actually give us their their expectations about the sorts of things that different individuals, different actors would do with the same event. Um, and not surprisingly, um, you find that speakers typically address a different set of entities than do secretaries. Journalists check different things than mechanics and so on. So it's in some sense um, pretty prosaic and expected, but it, it really doesn't fit with the conventional wisdom about selectional restrictions. Um, and then experimentally, um, in an online study, you can con contrast the how people will process uh, an expected or I'll call it, say plausible use of the verb, say the lifeguard saved the boy who had gotten in the waves, or the shopper saved five dollars with the implausible conditions. The lifeguard saved five dollars by buying all his sunscreen in bulk, or the shopper saved the boy who had gotten lost in the mall. Notice that these are these are entirely possible. They're they're not so bizarre as to cause people to throw up in their arms and walk out of the testing room, but, but they're not expected. They're not the congruent or the most plausible cases. And, and so in a moving window paradigm where people read these things incrementally, the lifeguard saved the boy compared with the lifeguard saved five dollars. In fact, what you find comparing the plausible in, is that teal versus implausible in uh, some shade of purple that I <laughs> don't name. Um, the lifeguard saved the is identical in the reading time, but when you get to the end, not at the patient in this case, but following it, you get a delay or an increase in reading the unexpected, the implausible. That is, it takes longer to read the lifeguard saved five dollars by buying compared to the lifeguard saved the boy who had. We're about to do an ERP study because we actually think the effect will probably occur at the patient under a more sensitive measure. What else might matter? And this is the only other experiment I think I'll show you at this point. Well, the instrument. So instruments are highly constraining of events. Um, and an experiment b done by Kaz Mutsuki, Ken McRae, uh, and Mary and I, um, we, we compared things, for example, like Susan used the expensive saw to cut the wood that she needed for her project versus Susan used the expensive saw to cut the paper that she needed for her project. That is, prototypically, if you ask people, what do you cut, they will say paper is the number one uh, reply. But um, you use a saw to cut a different class of things than you use uh, scissors or a knife um, or an ax. And we expected that uh, this would then uh, show up in terms of, again, of reading times, as it does. So here uh, in the uh, plausible purple, uh, to cut the, uh, Susan used, she used uh, the expensive, uh, the, the saw to cut the expensive wood that she needed, which is predicted and plausible. The reading times are lower, and they're lower at the patient. That is, immediately on hearing the patient, people show sensitivity to this is not the filler of this role that I expected given the instrument being used. So let me put it together. We have two strands of research. One, a kind of certainly an unusual view of words not as having uh, meaning in the conventional sense. Um, and then a set of experiments that, that stress the representational uh, capacity of a fixed template data structure version of the lexicon. Um, so going back to what I said is I think the way most sensible people think a lexicon is the store of words and long-term memory from which the grammar constructs phrases and sentences. A lexical entry lists a small chunk of phonology, a small chunk of syntax, and a small chunk of semantics. The, the problem is whether one goes with a definitional view of the lexicon or this view that I was outlining that was showed some sensitivity to meaning structure relationships. The following problem arises, which is the valence restrictions of a verb like cuts, um, in the simplest case, are what you'd expect and what you would enter into this form. But the butcher cuts different things. The butcher cuts meat. The pastry chef cuts cake. The lumberjack cuts wood. And different instruments um, imply different events and therefore different uh, patients. So using a saw, uh, the boy won't cut paper, but rather would cut wood. Using a saw, the surgeon will cut um, a bone. But we think location will matter. 
at the restaurant, the surgeon cuts a steak, and in fact, we suspect that there are going to be some very interesting interactions. These sorts of contingencies create a, an explosion in terms of combinatorics that I, I think at the very least will stress the notion of a fixed data structure, and that's really the point to take home at this point. What underlies this knowledge? Well, at this point, you should be thinking about things like scripts, frames, schemas, ideas that were very popular in the 70s and which had, and I think have, a lot of um, intuitive appeal, but which didn't make progress because the computational mechanisms for instantiating or representing schemas was fairly limited and brittle, and the kinds of combinatorics and sensitivity to usage um, didn't seem to be available. We think about these in terms of event representations, but they're really the same sorts of things. And now they raise questions of their own. What do we mean by an event? What is the, how do you, what's the representation of an event? Mechanistically, computationally, what's the definition of an event? We have some thoughts about this. This is um, something we're, um, we're thinking about a lot. Our view of events is that basically they are units, the, the minimum unit of causality. That what defines an event is an outcome that binds together participants. The temporal boundaries of an event are unbounded because the temporal relationship between a cause and its effect may be very distant. What this predicts is that some participants will be more or less critical to suggesting an event as a class. That is, there will be differences between agents and patients and instruments and locations in terms of how necessary they are as a class um, on event construal. And it predicts that there will be asymmetries that are specific to verbs. So for some categories, m the things that morticians do, um, a mortician may suggest a uh, cut, uh, say, more than um, uh, a woman, um, and that some instruments may be more or less constraining, depending on the particular event. So there'll be a range of abstraction, from very abstract to uh, very specific and lexically idiosyncratic. Um, how do you implement this, having said that these sorts of results seem to pose a challenge for the fixed data structure version of verb meaning. Well, we take our inspiration from what um, is a paper that I think is, is terribly important, a paper by Rommelhart, Smolensky, McClellan, and Hinton in 1986, um, that, that's probably not as widely read as, as it should be. It's a paper about schemas, where they grappled with the question of how do you capture the graded nat nature of, con of, of, of schemas and the fact that um, there are not necessarily fixed slots in a schema that need to be filled by a limited set of fillers, but rather they're graded, many of them are soft, and they're interactions, and you can blend schemas. Um, and the model was a very simple but very elegant model of rooms, where uh, human subjects were asked uh, to describe rooms in terms of a set of 40, 42, I think, room descriptors. And a, a network was built in which the weights between room descriptors reflected uh, probability structure, co-occurrence versus independent probability of these room descriptors. So that when seeded with an initial room descriptor, like the presence of an oven, over time activation spread and other things that would be found in a kitchen were activated. Um, the schemas were emergent and reflected the uh, ease with which um, other elements cohered. So one can measure the goodness of a schema. This is a goodness landscape, where certain combinations of room descriptors emerge um, associated with what you would call a bedroom or an office or a kitchen. But these things can be blended. So in one case, you could imagine an, uh, uh, a bedroom that's very large and fancy and has a couch in it or a studio that has a sofa and a, an oven and, and so on. So it's very elegant and I think very powerful. What we might think of then is instead of a system like this, which settles to a fixed state, of a system in which the constraints operate over time. An event now is a succession of things that are occurring with expected participants um, that are involved. 
in this system, then, you have words coming in as operators on that state space and moving the system through a mental space, the trajectory of which corresponds to a specific event and classes of events then would be expected to share similar patterns. So here's a simple, um, simple simulation which, um, to be honest, really serves only as a kind of metaphoric crutch to help visualize what I'm talking about. Um, imagine a recurrent network that is trained on a set of sentences, in fact, sentences that we got from our norming study, and over time learns to process these. Again, one can look at the uh, points in the hidden unit space that are evoked, the states that are evoked by a word, um, and when one does that simply statically looking at all of the states that the network moves into in response to hearing words, you see something not very informative. These blue points are the states of various words. But if you look over time, you see that when a person comes in, it moves the system to this state. A person uses a saw to cut, and the expectation then is a tree. A butcher uses a saw to cut meat. A person uses scissors to cut paper, and so on. In fact, different instances of the eat schema whoops, evoke classes of trajectories that are very similar. And different verbs and sentences show similar patterns. That is similar in the sense that each one is individuated, but they have a common structure over this space. So this makes the point I wanted to make, which is we think of words as not having meaning by themselves, not being operands on which we operate, but being stimuli in the good old-fashioned psychophysical sense. And the psychophysical properties of a word uh, are the effect it has on our processing and what we think of as meaning. Um, there's a simpler way of putting this, and this is a way that Dave Rummelhart put 30 years ago. When I was writing up some of this, um, I showed Jay McClellan, and Jay pointed out that Dave Rummelhart had said something like this in 1979, which I had completely forgotten at a conscious level, but I think subconsciously it had lodged, and uh, I'm a slow learner. Th uh, Thirty years went by before I finally uh, made, made sense of it. At the time, I remember thinking, that's really a cool metaphor and makes sense, but I'm not sure I know what it means. Um, I think I have a clear idea of what it might mean, and so I want to close with um, this... Uh, uh, description by Dave, which draws on a, an earlier metaphor by Donald Hebb. Um, lots of things go back to Aristotle and Plato. Well, there are a lot of things that go back to Hebb. Um, Hebb talked about perception as being a process that was similar to a paleontologist looking at the bones of a dinosaur. And here's where the bones come in. And the, the job of perception is to look at the world partial clues and to, out of that, construct the object that's represented in the same way that the paleontologist infers something about the dinosaur. Now, um, this is a, a cool metaphor. Uh, remember that in 1949, this was at the heels of or toward the end of the behaviorist era when notions about you know, speculation or inferences of internal processes uh, w w were not permitted. So it was a very radical idea. Dave used this metaphor to good advantage and said, vis-a-vis -vis words. My approach suggests that comprehension, like perception, should be likened to Hebb's paleontologist who uses the beliefs and the knowledge about dinosaurs in conjunction with the clues provided by bone fragments available to construct a full-fledged model of the original. In this case, the words spoken and the actions taken by the speaker are likened to the clues of the paleontologist and the dinosaur to the meaning conveyed through these clues. Or more elegantly and more simply, as, as Dave put it, words don't have meaning, they're cues to meaning. I want to end by making some thanks. Um, Mary and Ken have been critical in all of this. It's been a, a great collaboration over the past uh, decade, and we've been fortunate to work with a number of others, some of whom are here. Uh, Clinton is here, Ariel is here, I know Andy and Hannah are here. Janet Wiles and Paul Rodriguez were very important to this, for me, developing this notion of a word as an operator uh, and understanding the importance of the function as defining uh, meaning. Um, I want to thank, in addition to Ken and Mary, um, for their work, their participation in the uh, symposium tomorrow, as well as Ping Lee for organizing it and Jerry Altman and Kim Plunkett for traveling all the way from England to participate.
and of course, uh, very generous support from these folks. There's one final person I want to acknowledge who has had an enormous impact on the field and certainly an enormous impact on me. She's not here tonight um, in body. She's here in spirit through the tremendous impact that she's had on the field and on many of the people whom I see here. Um, Liz and Dave did not share a common personality. Those of you who uh, knew them, uh, Dave was, for the most part, quiet and mellow. Um, he had his moments, but, uh, and Liz was not. Uh, but, but they shared a tremendous originality, um, a willingness to be iconoclasts. Um, Liz was fearless in following an idea no matter where it took her and in the face of any criticism and, and sometimes a very difficult um, and hostile hostile criticism. She was uh, one of the bravest people I know, certainly one of the most creative. She was enormously generous, like Dave. She gave of her time and of her ideas, and she liked nothing more than seeing her friends and her colleagues succeed. So, um, I, although she can't be here, um, I, I'm really grateful for the opportunity tonight to, um, to use this as an opportunity to celebrate um, two giants in our field, Dave Rommelhart and Liz Bates. Thank you very much. Okay, we, um, we have time for uh, several questions. Um, so if you'd like to uh, ask one, just raise your hand. Yes, well, do you want to call them or? Um, if you uh, would encode a uh, large vocabulary, let us say, a large corpus with a recurrent net, uh, I suspect, although you might correct me on this, that the uh, dynamics of the resultant net would be largely opaque to uh, human understanding. And um, what might this say about, um, you know, the usefulness and utility of such a system and how it might compare to other approaches that are more symbolic and so on? Did everybody, everybody hear the question? Um, certainly scaling is an issue using, with, with, with many networks, certainly with networks that use localist representations. Gareth Gaskell and, and William Marsden Wilson a number of years ago looked at distributed representations and found that actually um, you can encode, and Paul Rodriguez did this as well, um, as well. Um, you can get 30,000, 40,000 words into the, the network. That is, so you can, get, you can get interesting, appropriate behavior using distributed representations. Um, I've, I've shied away from them because they are opaque. As soon as the dimensionality of the system um, is, is that great, it's very difficult to study. That's why uh, uh, Rodriguez, Wiles, and I use these simple, simple systems. And certainly, um, it's, it's uh, I think, one of the appeals of, of for example, Bayesian approaches um, is that there's a greater transparency. Um, so I have to say, I don't regard the opacity of neural networks as a, um, as, as a desirable feature. On the other hand, the brain itself is not uh, terribly opaque. Um, and, and so I think our job is, is one of trying to make transparent a system that's very complex, and that's the same problem we have with, with the brain. Uh, but clearly, your, your, um, the choice of formalism, um, I think, will depend on what your goals are and, and how far you can get in terms of analysis. Yes, down here. I had a similar question. Um, when, when you got to the point where you were talking about schemas, um, it occurred to me that some years ago we started shying away from schemas because both in um, AI and also in theory they weren't scaling up very well. They weren't very flexible. And uh, for some of us, from, for some of us um, that um, we turned more toward things like LSA where we reduce the dimensions of that space and then somehow predict in essence exactly what you're doing but use mathematical procedures like SVD and many other things that uh, uh, Walter Kinch talked about. 
to essentially reduce the dimensionality so that it can scale up. Um, what do you think about that? Well, I, I certainly agree with you that the, um, the early version of schemas were problematic in terms of inflexibility. Uh, and, and, and brittleness. Um, and this, this I take as the point of the demonstration from the, um, the paper by Rumhart Smolensky, Macron, and Hinton showing that you could get schema-like behavior that did have the kind of graded soft nature that you want from a schema. And it's exactly the same problem that one has with the symbolic approach, sort of the, the template um, definitional approach of, of, of a lexicon. I think uh, things like um, these sort of um, corpus-based approaches uh, give a lot of insight into the structure of, of, of a vocabulary and, and, and meaning. Um, as of yet, they haven't addressed, they haven't chosen to address um, issues of valence relationships, sort of the essence of grammar and contingent things. So, so the meaning, the position in, say, an LSA space, one would want to be contingent not simply on the corpus statistics, uh, depend on the corpus statistics as a whole, but contingent on local properties. And, and Kinch's talk suggests that maybe there's a way if you parse the thing, you know, you could, you could do that. So far it hasn't been done, which doesn't mean to say it couldn't be done. I'm, I would love to see something like that. Yeah. Going, going, going. going. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you. Well, now, um, you're, you're very kind, and now I'm really embarrassed. <laughs> so thank you all, and we'll see you at the reception and find out who the next Rumble Heart Prize winner is. <laughs>